I've said plenty of times in the past, I'm not the biggest fan of Drew DeVault, but every so often he'll post a blog post which I pretty much just completely agree with. The other day he posted what desktop Linux needs to succeed in the mainstream. Overall, this is an incredibly good blog post. I recommend going and reading it for yourself, but we're going to go over some of the main points he made and add some clarifications where I feel like he should have expanded upon what he was saying. Linux is not accessible to the average user today, and I didn't need to watch these videos referring to the LTT videos to understand that. I do not think that it is reasonable today to expect a non-expert user to successfully install and use Linux for their daily needs without a Linux friend holding their hand every step of the way. Now I think it's important to break this down into a couple of sections. Most people out there don't ever install a new operating system on their computer. Maybe they will upgrade to a newer version of the same operating system, but even then, I know people who have a Windows 7 system who never upgraded past Windows 7 just because they didn't know, you know, upgrading was a thing or they thought it would break something on their system and they just never wanted to do it. So accessibility in this way basically just means being able to buy a Linux system. Yes, there are certainly companies that do sell them, but you sort of have to go out of your way to find them. It's not like you can just go to your local tech store, there is the Windows section, the Mac section, and the Linux section. That Linux section is sort of what you need for the average user who doesn't care at all about how computers work. But if we're talking average user as in, you know, the average sort of gamer, most of those people at least know how to install Windows, especially if they've built their own system. And if you know how to install Windows, installing something like Ubuntu, PopOS, Manjaro, things that have very easy installers, isn't that difficult. If you know how to click the next button, it is absolutely no harder than going through the Windows installer. Daily driving Linux, on the other hand, is another question entirely. If everything they do in their workflow exists within a web browser, as long as they have that web browser, they're going to be perfectly fine. But the second they need to interact with the general Linux desktop, if they are that sort of non-technical person, let's say you've installed Linux for your parents, your grandparents, your partner, whoever it is in your family that just doesn't understand computers, what they're going to do is basically become an evolved form of Linus, and you're just going to become that person who is always troubleshooting for them, doing updates for them, getting programs installed for them. It's not going to be a seamless experience for them. Obviously, they should be going into it expecting the programs to be different, but the question is whether the programs that are available are actually intuitive to use. And the way the programs get developed on Linux lead to a lot of programs not being designed in intuitive ways. So Drew Vault is one of the original developers on Sway, and he believes it is one of the best desktop experiences you can have on the Linux desktop. However, it is designed for me. A professional expert level Linux user, I am under no illusions that is suitable for my grandmother. Linux is the operating system developed by programmers for programmers to suit our needs and we have succeeded tremendously in this respect. And this is one of the best and worst things about Linux. Most of the FOSS software out there is made by developers for those same developers. Take something like Alacrity for example. If you were developing Alacrity, you are developing Alacrity because you want to use Alacrity and you want Alacrity to be better. It's exactly the same with something like PCMNFM or most of the other software I have on my system. And if you have a developer mindset and you understand those weird developer choices that are made, there is so much amazing software out there to use. And if that's all you care about, that's entirely fine but you're never going to get mainstream users actually using Linux like that. What about people like, say, your grandmother who doesn't even know how to open up her emails? What reason is there to develop user-friendly and intuitive software if those same developers aren't the ones who are going to be using it? And this is where you start to see a lack of incentive structure in the FOSS world. Absolutely, FOSS projects can make money. There are tons of them that absolutely do. But for all of those projects that make a lot of money, there's hundreds of others that don't make a single cent, or maybe they'll get a couple of donations here and there. They'll definitely not be getting a livable salary, though. 
So there's really only three types of groups that develop software for other people. You have company-backed projects. You have those really, really large community projects, things like, you know, KDE and, and other projects of that nature. And then you have altruistic developers who have a lot of free time. And this intuitive software is certainly improving. I actually did a live stream the other day where I went back and checked out the first version of Ubuntu. And yeah, you know... Ubuntu is certainly better than it was back then, but there is still a lot of work that needs to be done. One problem though is a lot of projects that do have these resources aren't spending them in sensible ways. Many Linux desktop and distribution projects are spending their time on shiny new features, reskins, and expanding their scope further and further. This is a fool's errand when the project is not reliable at its current scope. A small, intuitive, reliable program is better than a large, unintuitive, unreliable program. Put down the paintbrush and pick up the polishing stone. I'm looking at you, KDE. And you know what? KDE is a great example, and, uh... Another great example is Caden Live. Caden Live is a great video editor. It has a lot of features, has tons and tons of features. Every time there is an update, more cool features are added. But there are still basic things which don't work the way you'd expect them to work. For example, if we look at the transform here, there's no way to lock the transform to the actual size of the clip. So the transform window is taking up like way more of the screen than it really should be. And I don't actually even know how to grab it from here. I think I have to like click on here. No, maybe click up here. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know how to actually move the transform in this window. I know there's a way to do it, I've never worked out how to do it consistently, though. Or how about the fact there's no easy way to apply an effect to every single clip you have selected? So if we select both of these, then grab this effect. You'd think that having them both selected and doing this would apply it to both, but no, it doesn't do that. The effects treat them completely separately. Knowing about these problems and having a problem-solving mindset, you can deal with these issues, but... These aren't issues that you really should have to deal with. They should just work in a sensible way. A user-friendly Linux desktop system should not crash. Now, obviously, that's impossible. Every bit of software will eventually crash at some point. What he means by this is it should be stable. It should not be possible to install a package which yeets GNOME desktop and dumps them into a Getty. The smallest of interactions must be intuitive and reliable so that when Linus drags files from a decompression utility into a directory in Dolphin, it does the right thing. What I think he's referring to here is when Linus tried to drag files from Arc and he was hovering over the folder, rather than trying to put the files into the folder he was hovering over, it was putting the files into the parent directory he was in. This will require a greater degree of cooperation and unity between desktop projects. Unrelated projects with common goals need to be reaching out to one another and developing robust standards for achieving those goals. I'm looking at you, Gnome. There are so many projects that try to redefine basic standards and then redefine them in ways that are basically the same as something else but just different enough where they are not compatible with each other. That can be easily rectified with these projects just acknowledging that the other projects do exist. It's not like either of you are making money anyway so it doesn't matter who's using which project. And this is even more true over on the Wayland side where a lack of standards leads to a lack of basic functionality, things like not being able to capture your screen. And it's not just the Linux software that needs to improve. We also have a lot of work to do in the Linux community. The discussion on the LTD video series has been exceptionally toxic and downright embarrassing. There is a major problem of elitism within the Linux community. It's one thing to go and criticize you know, the way that Linus did something or say, hey, you missed this thing that was very obviously blinking on your screen, or maybe this is the way that I would approach to anyone who's having a problem with this, you know, this is the way you could do it instead. But it's a jump from that to go to Linus is bad at Linux, Linus should never use Linux, he's a bad representative, he should never use Linux, everyone who follows Linus is a bad person, which you will certainly see if you go dig long enough through those comments. It's not everyone, it's absolutely a minority, but... 
There are certainly people who just have this mindset that if it's not done exactly right the first time, then that person has no reason to ever touch it again. There was also a lot of people being assholes to the PopOS developers when the whole Steam yeeting the desktop thing happened. And Drew once again says this is related to the Linux community, but I don't think that's the case. I think... For the most part, a lot of the people were coming directly from Linus's audience because they didn't seem to have any understanding of Linux whatsoever. Yes, there were definitely Linux users involved in it as well, but people can be toxic regardless of where they're actually coming from. I would like there to be less toxicity in the world, but there's only so much that I can really do. Ultimately though, those people are the minority, and if you're not one of those people and you see someone acting like that, don't engage them in an aggressive way. That's not gonna help anyone, it's just gonna make them feel like they are right in what they're saying. Just keep positive, and you probably won't change anyone, but maybe someone seeing the conversation will realize, hey, maybe not everyone in the Linux space is as toxic as I think they are. But beyond the toxicity, there are further issues with the Linux community. There are heaps and heaps of blogs shoveling out crappy non-solutions to problems noobs might be googling, most of which will break your Linux system in some way or another. Yes, there is absolutely a lot of awful blog spam, but if you look up any basic problem, it's not blog spammers that you're going to see straight away, it's going to be things posted on places like Reddit, on Stack Overflow, and a lot of the time, Sure, you might get an answer, but a lot of those answers aren't going to explain why they're answers or what might go wrong with the answer. If something does go wrong, what could you do to fix it instead? It's just like, oh, here's the thing you can do. Good luck. Enjoy the rest of your day. But other times the solutions are going to be outdated and no longer work anymore. But because places like Reddit lock posts that are old, there's no way for you to go and say, hey, this doesn't work anymore. Try this solution instead. So it's just a wall of nonsense that doesn't matter anymore. And this is bad enough sifting through this myself and understanding that, yeah, you might need to worry about when the solution was actually posted. If you're a non-technical user, I can't even imagine sifting through this. There are also very basic things that can be changed to seriously improve the user experience. For example, in the latest episode of the LTC Linux Challenge, Luke was trying to install OBS. And when you go to the OBS website, the first thing you see on the Linux side is a big blue button that says build instructions. Now, if you look over to the left, yeah, you can see that you can just install it like this, but the blue button is obviously what you need to go to, especially when on the Windows and the macOS side, that will take you to the installer. The worst thing about this, though, is going to the build instructions doesn't take you to the build instructions. It takes you to actually installing OBS the same way as you normally would anyway. A good way to look at Linux is Linux is a box of loosely related tools held together with staples and glue. Some installs, mine being one of them, more so than others. This is fine when the user understands the tools and is holding the glue bottle, but we need to make a more cohesive, robust, and reliable system out of this before it can accommodate average end users. I am always going to want to use a system that is like Arch, that is like Gentoo, that is like Void, because that's what I want out of my computing experience. But not every distro needs to be that, and I think that's very important to remember. One thing we do not need is to be more Windows-like, or any other OS. I think that this is a common fallacy found in end-user Linux software. We should develop a system which is intuitive in its own right without having to crimp off of Windows. Let's focus on what makes Linux interesting and useful and try to build a robust, reliable system which makes those interesting and useful traits accessible to users. If we look at, say, the mobile OS space, the experience on Android and iOS are very, very different experiences, but they are both intuitive in their own right, and even though I've used iOS like once in my life, I could pick up a new iPhone and get working with it perfectly fine. Obviously, there is a learning curve, but you can do basic stuff on it without really having to worry about much. 
Now, all of that sounds nice and lovely, but how would you actually do it? Well, Drew proposes a commercial Linux distribution where the cost of buying that distro goes back into the funding of the desktop environment and all of the other stuff that goes into actually making it. This is by no means a new concept. This is effectively what elementary does already. Yes, you don't need to pay for elementary, but it does heavily encourage you to do so if you want to support its development. Also, in the past, Red Hat and SUSE had boxed copies and you could just buy them in stores. Besides this idea, I really don't know of a workable solution. I am certainly not the financial guy. I do not have a better solution myself. But if you do have one, let me know down below. Also, let me know what you think of this article and what you think of this video. Do you think that the points that Drew made were good points? Do you think that... You know, mainstream Linux never needs to happen. You're happy with it being this niche little thing. Or do you want to see a day where there actually is a Linux section of computers in your general tech store? I would love to know. So if you like this video and you want to support the channel and become one of these amazing people over here, there is a Patreon subscribers only bearer pay linked in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech Over Tea available basically anywhere. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Robertson Plays where I live stream twice a week, upload about five or six YouTube shorts. And this channel is also available over on Odyssey. That's going to be it for me and I'm out.